Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to Just Eat. Um, Today we are here to talk about BDDR approach, uh, slightly different to the topic that we had before, which is the un-BDD way, because it is not the un-BDD way, we do use BDD. Uh, the basics of BDD, we, we have to use them because I absolutely love using those uh, tools that come from BDD, like the three amigos and uh, having that discussion and having that uh, ease of communication with the rest of the team. Uh, but what is different uh, here is, well, I think we all know about why we, uh, I mean, if, if any one of you kind of disagrees to why we use it, then maybe we can have a conversation later. But according to what we feel is it improves the conversations and it obviously helps non-technical people to join the conversation when they are actually uh, not very much comfortable looking at the code. And obviously it lets us know what's best and what's not. But then how many times do technical people reading the feature files? I mean, because I think in all my experience, I have seen very, le very less of them asking me, can I open my framework, show them the feature files, and if they can read it, if they can improve on it. So I think my, our, our problem was that feature files were not used at all. And we were adding one more layer on top of our existing complex automation framework by uh, getting those step definitions and then uh, adding more words and converting them into methods and just adding a lot more complication to our automation framework. And personally, because I was I came from a Ruby background with Cucumber, which already has a lot of good tools and it is mature uh, to provide uh, better tools for uh, writing those feature files and step definitions and using specflow, it doesn't really help. Um, and for me, it was adding a lot more complexity. I mean, Dimitris, you can, you can vouch for that, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll present you two case studies. Uh, both are from two different type of projects. One is an app, which is a driver app, which is generally used by, which is given to the drivers, uh, which I will be presenting. And then there is another uh, a case study, which Dimitris will be talking about later. So uh, what we've done is we've taken out these step uh, feature files altogether from our uh, framework. So this started when we, uh, when I, uh, when I had a discussion with our uh, team, and everybody was like, "Can we just get rid of feature files? Nobody reads it. Why do we have it in first place?" And I was an advocate before of writing feature files, and I had spent time with teaching, I mean, telling people how to write a good feature file. And then I realized I've spent so much of, I've wasted just. And then I, uh, after that discussion of, can we get rid of all those feature files? I kind of uh, thought again, and I was like, actually, what what value does it give us? I mean, to be honest, none. And so we um, we created uh, we we rewrote our whole framework. And the only the only question that I had was, will it be easy for anybody to read? Well, it is very easy for anybody to be to read. Whoever know whoever who whoever who know who knows how to code can read the feed, can read the uh, test easily. Uh, so I think taking that extra layer out really helps us uh, because they are easy to maintain, and there is no overhead of converting those step definition into methods and then adding extra layer of complexity on top on top of it. So very quick example was. If you look at the method name, it itself says grab ensure if the light order remain, if in flight orders remain in in order of due time, and then there are different methods which are called uh, so as to uh, uh, flow uh, follow the whole flow, and then at at the um, sorry, uh, and then you actually when you go through the whole test, you understand what it is doing. Uh, so by 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 using this approach, I think our, our framework has become more uh, maintainable and easy to be read by uh, whoever wants to read it. I'm sure BAs and product people, they don't really read the frameworks. They don't really uh, look at the code. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, very quickly, this is how uh, 
of the framework looks, which is just two folders having test and having the pages. And the uh, uh, we use the page object model wherein we've got the uh, uh, all the good qualities of encapsulating it and then getting the uh, uh, fixtures there and uh, but reducing the overhead of having two more folders of writing the step definitions and the features feature files all of them are already covered in Jira so it is not that we are ignoring the good good things that we were getting from BDD we are having that discussion we are having three amigos we are already discussing and that is an ongoing process uh, but not captured in our automation framework and uh, the other bit that I was very much nervous about when we said we won't be having the uh, feature file was how will it look on the cloud or on CI? To be honest, it looks as good as it was before. So you know what the, what tests are running, you know uh, what is expected, you know if it's passing or failing. So from my uh, the project that I'm talking about, we didn't really miss feature files. Uh, this hasn't. This is not for all this all the uh, projects. Only for a few, but I, we would want it to be for all. <laughs> and I over to Dimitris for his. It, I'll tell you guys that slide. Because we are not doing that yet. <laughs> Wait. Oh. Is he here? So, so yeah, a, another example, I guess, from one of our other components, like a worker, which is a window service, reacts to events that are happening throughout the, the system. And it's a bit trickier to test because it has a lot of asynchronous stuff, so you don't know when something will happen. Like the worker might also be publishing events to itself to consume later, so you only care about the input and the output, and the output is going to happen. So we're going to look at an example first using SpecFlow. So to be honest, I picked one of the most complicated uh, in our system. Uh, so it's a bit big, but we can go through. So the scenario is, uh, certainly we can run uh, auctions uh, to, for the restaurants to, to bid. And in the end, we're going to have that are going to be displayed as uh, the sponsor restaurants in the, in the search page. So this is like when we have multiple restaurants and they're winning a fixed fee auction. And as part of the given is where we want some test restaurants. So we're creating three test restaurants in a specific uh, area. We're going to create uh, an, an auction and the restaurants are going to place the, the bids. And that's the, the setup. And then when the, the period ends, some we need to do the assertions. Go back. So then we'll see that some restaurants should be notified because they are winners. Some restaurants should not be notified because they're not the winners. We should have the correct winning amount based on some uh, internal logic we have. Or some bids should not be marked as winning because one restaurant didn't win this auction. And also some invoices should be created for the, for the winners. So now if we want to do the same using like builders and necessarily removing the, the spec flow, we, we could do something like that. We could create some builders like a test restaurant builder and by calling the dot build method, that will create a test restaurant. Now in that case from the test, I don't care about the, test, the, the restaurant name. I don't care about the address, the phone. It's not important to what I'm testing right now. So I'm not specifying any overrides on this builder. Now for the second uh, test restaurant, because I'm interested to be in the same home area as the first one, I'm going to specify a home area, which is the home area from the first restaurant. And the same for the third. So for me, an advantage of this is that we, in comparison with SpecFlow or any other feature files, is that I can immediately see what's important for the, for the test. So if something is not important for the test, probably it shouldn't be in, in these builders. You can use the, you can you know, generate random data inside the builder, and the builder at the end is going to return what it has generated. So that test restaurant one there, I have access to the home area, I have access to the restaurant ID, I have access to everything I need to, that I might need to use later. But I don't really care about all the small details or how this restaurant is created, because this restaurant in the end, it might be like, I don't know, five, six inserts to different tables. But from this, from this level, I don't care how a test restaurant is created. I only care that I get a test restaurant with some random details. Or if I want specific details, I can use the override. So then I'm creating the auction. So similar, I just need that is ending soon. 
about the dates. I don't care if this is going to run against Australia or New Zealand or Italy, that the date is going to be different. All these are hidden from my test because I just care about that is going to end soon. Now, the builder is responsible to take that into account, the, the deployed tenant or something like that, and create the correct dates. But when I look at the test, I don't care about all these details. And some more about creating uh, the auction. And the important thing is, I really care that this auction has uh, two available positions. Because I'm creating three restaurants, essentially the two of them will be the winners and the third one will, will lose, right? Uh, so if I didn't have available positions, it wouldn't, uh, two, it wouldn't work. And then I'm placing the bids. And yeah, this can get a bit uh, big because there's a lot of information, but uh, most of it is about the, the setup of uh, placing the bid. And I think the important thing is that the bid was placed like 10 minutes ago, the second bid 90, 90 minutes ago, and then eight minutes ago. Now, what exactly that means, again, in dates and for different uh, regions and stuff like that, it's not important in the test. I don't see any of the, you know, create new date time or in this time zone and all this stuff. I don't, I don't care. It's abstracted for me because it's not really important. For me, the important thing is that it reads in a fluent way and I can see what exactly is doing. So this is closer to my domain and abstracts the, the logic behind it. And then I'm going to publish like perform auction ended check, which is publishing a message, which will cause the worker to, to do some, some stuff. And then we're coming to the assertions. Now, I didn't include all the assertions, just as an example, but as I said, the first one is that the first restaurant should be notified to the mobile number and the alternative uh, number, and the same for the second restaurant, or that the third restaurant should not be notified because it's not one of the winners, or that then restaurant one bid should be winning. So this is similar to the, the, the assertions I had on the spec flow, the, the then steps. And then in the cleanup, the good thing I like when you're using builders that way is that because all the builders are coming from a factory and I have like this iBuilder uh, interface, all the builders implement a cleanup method and then I can just call the dot cleanup and it will go through all the builders that I have used and call the cleanup method. So then my cleanup is, I don't have to think about what I need to clean up. Each builder is responsible about cleaning its own stuff since it knows what it has created and the tear down on the test looks very simple. And that's how it looks on Resharper. And that's how it's going to look on Team City 2 when we run it. Like we have auction ended, when an auction ended and multiple restaurants won, then an invoice should be created, then restaurants should be notified, etc. For me, it reads fluently. And okay, it's not exactly the same as as a feature file, that's, that's a given, right? Because this is not uh, written in a super plain text. But to me, it's very close enough and I don't, ha I don't have to worry about uh, all the feature files and maintaining all the steps and doing all this stuff. Also, another very positive thing for me is that all in one file. I don't have to jump between different files to find the correct step to figure out what this test is doing. I can open this class and everything that is important for this test will be there. If uh, from a builder, we don't care about the specific aspect of that builder, we just don't use it and we let the builder either use random data or you know, we can specify the data we want. But when we specify the data we want, it means it's important to the test. So when I'm looking at this test, I know what's important and what's not important. And for me, that's a very positive thing and very big thing because it helps you understand what the test really cares about and what it doesn't care about. And it helps you understand the behavior of the system and how to, you know, maybe investigate if something goes wrong. So to sum up, we, that for me, BDD is not the feature files. You could very easily have feature files and not doing BDD. For me, BDD is about all the discussions we're going to have with the developers and writing maybe, and maybe taking a step back and thinking this on a higher level, but it doesn't necessarily need to be into a feature file. Uh, and also for me, we should always create a DSL, a domain specific language, regardless if we're using a BDD or not. For me, it's very important to try and abstract much of the logic of the application away from, from the test. Like when I'm, when I'm seeing tests that they're doing like 10 inserts and uh, it's very difficult then to, to read them back and try to understand. And maybe after a week, after a few days, maybe it's very easy to read them. But after three months, six months, 10 months, are you going to remember why you had to do all these inserts and all these updates? 
Probably not. And from my experience, I wouldn't remember probably the next day, but maybe I have a very short memory, but who knows. Uh, so my, my point is that if you're using a, a DSL, regardless if you're using feature files or not, it's a good way then you abstract the logic of your application and you only uh, highlight the important bits. Argument is then if you have the DSL, do you need the because by writing the, the fixture file in a specific way, then you can get similar results on, on your CI or you know, on the reporting tools and stuff like that. And for, for us, I think this has worked very well. And we, it's not that we went crazy and we said, okay, kill Specflow or Concumber from all our applications and, and stuff like that, right? But every time we had a new uh, feature and we're working on a new API, we would have the, do we really want a feature file? And we're like, um, probably not. Let's not add it. More time and focus on trying to expand our DSL and try to write something that you know abstracts all the complication of our application and it's closer to our domain and it's easy to read rather than trying to write all the spec flow, all the features. So I think that's the main thing. Uh, so it's your time to ask uh, questions. And, and I was hoping that I wouldn't have any. Or I can throw it away and kill someone. Ooh, okay. Can you please pass the door? <laughs> well, it's mostly for the recording, so. Ah, uh, okay. Hello. Uh, so basically, uh, you could have. Now encapsulate all these uh, changes and writing in C sharp code in those steps instead of having these massive tables and so on with predefined data. Uh, I sh understand and share your pain. We have 1400 tests written in the uh, cucumber, so we wanted to ditch it some point. But the things that you provided, like all these builders, cleanups, and so on, this could be easily solved with text and encapsulating stuff without these tables. So I've created three bits which were created some time ago. And inside you can use these pictures. So I don't, I still don't see like 100% why it's much better for you to, to use these not feature files. Yeah. I, one of the big problems I had always with the feature files, first of all, is that I have to jump between different files. Mm -hmm. In this case, I don't. Everything is inside one file, which makes my life much easier. So for me, that's a benefit one. I don't have mm -hmm. to go, okay, find the step file, find the other step file. Also, in in, in SpecFlow or Concomber and stuff like that, sharing data between the steps, it, it, it is possible, but I don't like the way it forces me on doing some things. Uh, because either I have to create like a class that probably is going to be injected through IOC, so okay, it's not too nasty. I'm not talking about putting stuff in the, in the context, that's even nastier, right? But let's say you do it properly through IOC. But from my experience, this class will be mutated very quickly without you realizing. And also when you're reading the test, then you don't know who really create, created that object and for what reason. And after a few iterations, that object will be mutated and be used for reasons that you were not anticipating. And then when you go into the step files, it's like, okay, this property is being set in scenario A and B, but this property is not being set in that scenario and it's being set in another scenario because it was easy for us to add it there instead of creating something more specific. And over the time, I have seen that it mutates that much that it's not very useful and it's not very easy for me to understand what's going on. And then I have to jump through all the files to, to figure out what's going on, right? And also, SpecFlow, especially on Visual Studio, I always had problems. Or let's say I want to rename a step. It's not as straightforward as renaming a method on a class. So usually, it might go well, but many times it doesn't go well. And I have to go and clean up the cache of SpecFlow mm -hmm. and do some other stuff that maybe I shouldn't care about. Uh, but it's not that easy. And then I have to match that rename to a step and they need to match exactly, right? And I need, what, what, let's say I create a restaurant. If, if I wanted to pass specific data for its test, then I'd mean, it means in my steps I need to be probably a bit more intelligent, right? And have maybe a bunch of ifs. If I'm going to translate that to, to a table or a, or a DTO from SpecFlow, then some probably are null or empty or stuff like that. So I'll have to populate them. So it's not, it's not as easy. Where with this, I don't need to pass all the data that that you know that builder really needs. I only need to pass the data that I I need from my test. And for me, that's the biggest advantage. That the moment I see that, I know exactly that. Okay, this test cares about three restaurants. It's 
dying. Uh, he cares about three restaurants, two that they need to be in the same area. And that's the only thing I care. Everything else, I don't care. In some other tests, if I care about the phone number, for instance, because I'm going to send an SMS or there's some specific behavior around the phone number, then I could have with phone number X. And for me, that highlights immediately that the phone number is important to this test. It's not important to the other tests, but to this one is important. Now, if, we, if you go and trans, try to translate that into spec flow, probably you end up with a massive table always passing all the information because that's the easiest uh, thing to do. And then it's not, when you read it, you have five columns, let's say, it could be more, but you don't care about all of them for this particular test scenario. You only care about the home area, as in this example. Everything else just noise for me. It is used by what it was uh, meant for. I mean, so why even bother adding that yeah. extra complexity yeah. to your framework? That's very nice to read in books, but the real life yeah, is different. It, yeah, <laughs> the real life is different. In principle, I, I am absolutely okay with it. But in practice, how often have I ever seen a BA asking me to open a feature file so he wants to add a, uh, a, a new scenario in it? Never. Everything is in Jira. And that's the that's one place of truth, which is fine, which is easily accessible to them. Why to add extra layer of complexity in our framework when we absolutely can understand what what it is written, what is written in it? So, okay, thank you. Another main point is that regardless when you're using extra tools from from the main stuff, right? It adds a complexity, and for me, it's about return of investment. Do I get anything back from that? I get what I really liked about Specflow or any BDD framework is that you get a nice readable report, right? But maybe there is another way to get something similar. And I can get something similar. And it makes my life easier in maintaining this, this test because then I don't have to randomly regenerate feature files because something went wrong or I don't have to mess with all, all these things. It's much easier to go to a method and rename it because something changed in my domain. Uh, instead of going in all the feature files, trying to find where this step particular is being used. And, and also with the steps, I have seen many times where people try to reuse them, and then you have a step that does similar things, but slightly different. Because the text is different on the feature file? Yeah, it could. And over time, it, yeah. I have seen many steps that they have become so complicated with so many ifs and stuff like that, that I can take away all of that and let the builder take that responsibility for me. And it makes my life much easier because and much easier to read. So I don't know if that answer your question, but yeah, it's very <laughs> detailed. Awesome. Thank you. Other questions? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I have a question about reporting. So when you run a set of tests, and then when you want to report the results to the rest of the team, uh, so how do you achieve the the result of making everyone understand which tests have failed and uh, which tests have passed. Sending them, as, they all know where the tests are running and everybody has a responsibility of going there and seeing the tests themselves. So, but if you go to Team City, yeah. you, you will see the tests. And uh, then you will see the, as I saw you on Resarper. So if you go back onto the test cloud also, the, the link, uh, the slide that That, that one, yeah. So this is the report that is there on the cloud, so which shows which tests are passing in which operation without the test feature file. So, which is quite readable by everyone who's interested in working. And for instance, we have maybe the application select because they're on CSR, but we're following the same pattern on, on the front end, which is TypeScript. And we're using Mocha to do the, the assertions. And then we can use Mocha Awesome report, which it's part of the build artifacts. You're going to click a link, and you're going to see a very nice HTML report with exactly all the tests that run with the description and, and stuff like that. Uh, so the reporting aspect, I'm not worried. I think uh, we give the, the feedback uh, back. But also, all the developers should be, should, should be knowing what, what tests we're running, why we're running them, et cetera, right? Uh, it's not, I cannot keep up with eight developers. It's the responsibility of adding tests and maintaining uh, this thing. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, like, how do you communicate to developer and the product owners of BA uh, that for a feature, given feature, these are the tests that you wrote and this is how I'm expecting feature to behave. 
because you're writing it in more of a technical way developer will understand but ba or product owner but it is how okay. will explain it to them so uh, this is kind of a uh, mindset change so when we have our huddle or three amigos at the start of when we pick up a feature file we discuss it with the with the develop everybody is, whoever is involved in that feature file is in, included in that huddle and we discuss what is required what are we going to test it and there is a let, there is a test plan added to the jira ticket mm -hmm. and that is where uh, the conversation starts okay. but that doesn't stop there because the developer and the tester are working closely with each other and writing the test together so yeah. they they have the whole coverage of the feature and uh, a ba can always go back to the ticket uh, and look at the acceptance criteria over there but we necessarily don't lick any feature file because we don't have no, that's and because the other thing that I I can uh, share with the experience of having the previous way of working, wherein we were writing the feature files, the 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 feature files are meant to change so much so that you can't really maintain them in Jira also, because the latest version of uh, feature file, even if you've added uh, it two days back or three days back, when the when the when the product has changed or the uh, the functionality has changed, you can't always go back and update the Jira ticket. So uh, I think that 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 problem of not having the clear picture of that uh, that particular feature on Jira will always be there. Uh, you can't really control the changes uh, if there has happened on a feature file because okay. it is meant to change. And yeah, no, my query was more on process. How do you kind of but, yeah, get we, together we, and we uh, because the developers and testers are working very closely with, with on on the feature. Mm. uh they both understand and uh, and write all the all the tests okay. and to be honest if we're doing things correctly uh, these are like end-to-end -end tests right but uh, and that's where usually the bdd is being used but if the most interesting case is usually you should be testing them on a lower level yeah. so what we try to test on the functional level on the end-to-end -end level is just a happy path just to make sure that configuration, maybe permissions of the AWS and, and stuff like that, they, they really work. And in general, a happy flow of the, our main flows of, of the system. But the most interesting cases where you might want to break down into multiple test scenarios and stuff like that, they would be on lower level. And usually, I haven't seen any integration tests or unit tests that where you'd use uh, BDD. So for me, you lose there the advantage already because you're not going to cover here all the cases, or you shouldn't, because then this test will be very slow, right? And I have worked in teams where there's a lot of trust between the business and the developers, as in here, and no one ever asked us to give us, you know, oh, show me the feature file with all the tests you have. I want to make sure you have covered everything. That discussion has never happened. Or I have worked in places where there was not any trust, but again, they wouldn't ask us for the feature files. They would say, okay, this is not working. Why is it not working? Fix it. Yeah. They, they, they wouldn't say, maybe they also they didn't understand the reason. Like they didn't understand that maybe, you know, there's a very subtle time, time zone difference between Australia, Sydney and, uh, you know, UK when there's a daylight savings and things went wrong or the, all the other subtle bugs that you can have in a system. They wouldn't understand that and they don't care. They just want a working product. And so we never had, I never had to give them the feature file. Okay, look, these are all the test scenarios. And, and also it's very easy to mislead people. You can have a feature file that covers almost everything and it seems perfect. But some assumption has been made down the line anyway, and it's not really doing what it's meant to be doing. It says that, okay, when I do X, then Y is happening, but that's not really what, what happens because there is somewhere an assumption, right? And the same can happen with, with this one. It's just, it's one step, it's one level closer to you to realize that there is an assumption. <laughs> one more question. Yeah, well, we have an auction model, so maybe we can be. <laughs> how you are taking the test data like uh, where you from excel sheet or you know or database or how you taking the data for the method i mean on on our projects usually we use uh, fake faker js for the front end or bocus which is a, a port for faker js and we just create random test data so random restaurant name random home area random phone number based on some rules there because the phone number you know needs to to follow the pattern that uk australia <laughs> italy or all, all this stuff uh, but we don't use csv uh, we might use maybe test case source in, in some cases but usually on the functional level as the example i showed it's going to be a happy path i'm not going to do a lot of permutations 
if I'm doing a lot of permutations on that level, we are missing some tests on a lower level and I'm doing something wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. So it's just some random test data through, there are a lot of libraries that you can get random test data, right? Test fixture, uh, Bogus, and so, so forth, depending on the language that you're using and, and stuff. So we don't care so much. For us, for instance, the restaurant name is a string. It doesn't have a, an important aspect. Uh, some other stuff like auction ending and dates and stuff like that. Well, yeah, we're going to create something that mimics the, the reality. Uh, but depending on the case, it's case by case. We don't have a CSV or something like that. No, my question is, what about the cards? You know, for example, I order the food for 10 pounds. So I want to pay 10 pounds. So what is the, how you are comparing the actual and expected and what about the, you are using the test cards? Yeah, there are test cards. Well. Yeah, yeah, I guess in I your... No, I'm not across it. But yes, there are test cards. That are so what about... I'm, the... I'm not across that particular framework, but in ours, we use, uh, like you said, we use fixtures, we use mock data uh, to mock the... Uh, I, I guess it depends on the case and what exactly you're testing, right? For instance, if I have an event, restaurant created, and I want to make sure that it was added in our database, uh, then I fire that event with a random restaurant name, but I have, I know that random restaurant name. So then I can use that to assert on the database layer that this was created because I know the expected value. Okay. So in some other cases, uh, and we, we can use what we have created as expected and match it with what we have in the, in the output. So our input is randomly generated, and based on that, we can use that for, for the output. Now, if you're using some crazy maths or, or stuff like that, maybe rand generating random data is not, is not useful for you, right? And it's not the, the correct tool because you need to know the output for every, every, every given time. So in that case, yeah, we could use CSVs or the test I show you, they're driven by end unit. So you can use test case, test case source. Uh, there are other ways that you can you know, achieve similar uh, results. I don't think we have more time for any more questions. So we can have a discussion later. Yeah, did you shut down your computer? So you have to. <laughs> that was what I wanted. Uh, if you just go back to the link and join the um,
Uh, good evening. Good evening. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah, cool. Everyone hear me at the front? Hope so. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about test and mindset in the microservices world. Unlike the previous talk, it's not going to be that technical. Um, not because I don't believe that testing is technical, but it's just a different angle, really. Um, so before we begin, let me introduce myself. I've been 11 years experience in QA, testing, engineering, whatever you want to call it. Um, so throughout that time, I've been a test analyst, QA analyst, QA architect, uh, QA whatever. I'm now a lead QA. Um, I'm a husband and a father to two kids, and I am unfortunately a Sunderland fan, although we have had some good news recently, but I won't bore you with that. Um, that's my Twitter and my blog, although I'm not as active as I probably should be. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to just discuss why we test. Um, this is open to interpretation from anyone, really. Does anybody have any ideas why we test? Anyone want to give any suggestions? Find bugs. Find bugs, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, sorry? Let's go risk, ooh, nice. <laughs> Cool. So there's, there's four things, four or five things here, I remember. Um, the first one is to break illusions about the product. So we've all been there. Develop, as I said, this code works fine, but when we come and touch it and we find bugs. This can piss developers off, but you have to remember that we didn't put the bugs there. We really found them, right? And I'd much rather us find them than the developer or even the public find them themselves in production. So that's kind of why, that's one of the reasons why we test. We find problems in the product. So kind of similar to breaking illusions, but this is more about finding problems, reporting them to the people that need to know, and then then make the decisions. To make unknowns known. So we can only test what we know. We can't test things that we don't know. So it's very important to ask the questions, and kind of uncover any unknowns, and use that to inform what testing we do. To find the black swan. Has anyone heard about the story about the black swan? So many, many years ago, talking about probably 100 years ago, maybe, maybe more, maybe less, nobody believed, well, everyone believed that swans were white. It wasn't until people traveled to Australia and they found hundreds of thousands of black swans that people thought, oh, our assumptions were wrong there. There are swans that are black. And it's kind of similar to turkeys, right? So if you were a turkey, you'd be coming up to Thanksgiving, you'd be fed every day. And you'd be fed loads of food. You think life is absolutely great. You'd be running around in the fields playing with other animals, maybe, I don't know, until that day comes when you're killed for Thanksgiving. So if you were to use that past data, you kind of assume yeah, everything's great. I'm gonna live forever. I'm gonna have this lifestyle forever. Until that day comes when you're killed. So we kind of as testers, we need to say bear that in mind and use that know that not everything is perfect. Don't make assumptions about things based on past data. Sure, it can guide you, but don't live by it. And finally, we test to understand. We test to understand the product, and we use that to inform our testing. So to help us do that, we have what is often banned a testing mindset, but what actually is a testing mindset? So I'm going to cover some of the things that I think make up a testing mindset, but it's not everything, so don't like hold me to it, please. Um, so we have, well, first off, actually, so in terms of the brain, is everyone aware of the left and the right brain? So the left brain is your logical brain, the right brain is kind of your creative, your emotive brain. So critical thinking very much lies in the left brain. It's a logical thing, it's a binary thing. It's kind of like, what, what can go wrong in this product? It's having that critical thinking about the product, not necessarily accepting what everyone says about it. Planning as well, you know, that's kind of a logical thing to do. How can I test this and so forth? Critical distance collaboration, experience, and creative exploration. We'll go into a bit more detail about what these are. So in terms of critical thinking, we definitely, as testers, need to think critically about 
software development so we don't get fooled. So like the, like the turkey, really. So if everything tells us it works, we need to damn well prove that it works. That is our job as testers, right? We need to have that critical thinking. Um, assumptions are dangerous. We all know what happens when you assume. Make an ass out of you and me. Um, planning. So I'm not just talking about test plans. We've all been there. We've got loads of test plans made up of test cases. We need to know full well what we're testing, when we're testing it, and how we're going to test it. If we don't know that, then who knows what we put into production. And similarly, I like to think of us as the headlights of the engineering team. We've got an eye on future items that are coming up in the next sprint, maybe, or whatever methodology you're using. Um, we are aware of that, what challenges it may bring to the team, kind of how we can tackle them challenges. Critical distance, so we've all been there, right? We've all been so embedded in something that we don't necessarily see the flaws. We think, oh, this is absolutely awesome because we've worked and we've put our heart and blood, blood and soul into this. But let me tell you a story. Um, when I was younger, my now wife, so we've been together a while, she, I wrote her CV. Um, we sent it out to probably like 20 to 30 places. And then she read the CV. Her phone number was wrong. So there's no way for these companies to get in touch with her. But because I was so embedded in writing that CV, I didn't see it. To be honest, that makes a case for maybe shifting less left. She could have maybe reviewed the CV before she sent it out. That it was all my fault, apparently. But never mind. Um, but it's, it's very much why I get people to read important emails before I send them. So who's ever written an important email, sends it, and then realizes, oh crap, I've said something wrong or something like that. You are too embedded in writing an email. You don't necessarily see the flaws. You don't see the spelling mistakes. Um, and finally, just don't be that chilly before the product. Don't just go, hey, everything's great. The developer said it's going to work. Don't do that. That is a bad path to go down. Don't let the developers drive the testing that you do. You should be driving the testing that you do and the testing for the team. So collaboration is key, right? So we work with other teams in the microservices world. We work with many other teams. You need to think of the bigger picture, right? You need to communicate with other teams. You need to find out what changes they're making, how will it impact you? Because otherwise you're going to end up in a bad, bad place. You can also find out you may have a problem, right? So if you work with other people who have faced that same problem, they may have solved it and you can reuse that same steps. And because we are specialists in testing, we know what's happened before. We know what we think might happen and we can plan for it. We are customer focused, right? And I'm not just talking about the end user, I'm talking about clients who may consume us and so forth. We know what they're expecting so we can bear that in mind when doing our testing. And we're also aware of how certain biases can influence people. So let's use that to our advantage. And finally, we need to do more creative exploration. So we thrive on asking questions. My daughter thrives on asking questions. She asks why, why, why? We need to do more of that. Um, we need to know more information about the product. We need to use this information to our advantage and uncover any of the unknowns we may not, well, we don't know, right? Um, and we learn new things quickly because we do want to test software better. We're all here tonight because we care. And because we care, we are one step ahead of probably 90% of the people that we work with. Um, and I saw a good advert yesterday in the tube. Um, and it was, um, don't be the tourist, be the explorer. And it's about going off that beaten path. Don't necessarily follow test cases step by step. Have a think about what you can do to kind of explore the software a bit more. Kind of try and break it, you know? Don't necessarily just bash the keyboard. Be creative and think about how you can do that. So we're also here to talk about microservices. Um, there's probably many definitions of microservices. Who wants to have a stab at their definition of what a microservice is? Don't jump, please. Anyone? Adam? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's probably many, many different definitions of microservices, probably not right or wrong one. Um, but I've kept it really simple. Um, a service that does one thing and does it well, right? That's probably the most simplest definition that I could give of a microservice. Um, if you want an expert's definition, 
That's Martin Bowder's definition. Um, I won't read it word for word, but it goes into a bit more detail about what it is. Um, so we spoke about what microservices are, but there are many benefits of doing microservices, or otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight. Otherwise we wouldn't all be using them in some form or another. So one of the benefits is independence. So the teams are independent, but are free to kind of choose how they develop something, the, the contracts that they create, it's down to them. They have the autonomy to kind of do what they want in that regards. And similarly, they are free to choose what technology they use. They're not tied to a technology of a whole monolithic architecture. If they find a new tech and it solves a problem, they're free to implement it. Um, and testing. So when it comes to testing microservices, it's not exactly, it's a lot simpler than testing something massive, right? You're, you're testing small changes, you're testing incremental changes, and it's about kind of zeroing in on these changes and being able to test them to the best of your ability to kind of give you confidence that the software does what, you, what it should do. And the last one you can see is environments. So previously when working in a modern monolithic architecture, you need to have everything deployed to that environment to test it. With a microservice, you, you just need that service deployed in any, any um, dependencies that you may or may not have. So you can also scale these, mic these environments a lot simpler, these microservices. You haven't got to scale the entire stack. You can serve the services individually. You haven't got to worry about uh, scaling everything. It's a lot cheaper to run. My apologies if this is all like not new for you, but it's good just to get like a base, in, a line in the sand, shall we say. Um, speed, speed in terms of um, development, in terms of deployment. It's a lot quicker to kind of deploy a small, microservice than it is um, when deployed a monolithic service. Previously, where when I worked, we would take two to four weeks to deploy. We're now doing daily deployments, so it's kind of a good, good trade-off. And it's a lot simpler in terms of analyzing and understanding where things go wrong, because you haven't got to worry about a whole stack of logs, generating the logs kind of down to that, that service. So this is still great. Um, is it too good to be true? Like microservices do have so many benefits, um, but there are challenges. But I personally feel the role of the test has adapted or changed, or at least it should kind of adapt to tackle these challenges. And we're going to look at some of the challenges just now. Um, so I've got four. There are probably many, many more. Um, these are the four top ones that have affected me. So systems integration testing is one of the big challenges. Um, I'm not necessarily in an ideal world, arguably you wouldn't need systems integration testing for microservices, but I don't live in an ideal world, and as testers, arguably none of us should live in an ideal world. Um, but there are challenges around this kind of defining what what uh, other services that you integrate with, what versions they are going to be, where they're deployed, what test data you're going to use for that systems integration testing. It's a bull's eight to try to plan that and organize that. Um, when it comes to testing, so contracts change. Contracts change quite a bit. Kind of, it's well enough, hard enough being aware of these changes, but being able, being able to test them is another matter. Um, thinking of the bigger picture. So teams that work in microservices tend to focus on their own microservices. They don't necessarily think of other people that may be consuming them. They become very much us and them. And finally, that last one is tech. That's it find that. Um, so tech, so I said teams are free to choose their own technologies, but in terms of being able to kind of move people around teams, that can cause a challenge. Not everyone's kind of skilled in everything that they, in all different technologies, but it's kind of like, how do we manage that? That's a small trade-off for teams being able to have the autonomy to choose whatever tech they want. So there are many facets of a tester's mindset and skill set that can and should be used to tackle these challenges. So we're just going to go into them and kind of understand how it can help. So if we look at the first challenge with regards to systems integration testing. So this requires deployments of multiple independent components owned by many different teams. And then there's a question about what about test data and, and this is a nightmare. So in terms of the testing mindset, if we think back to what we had before, so we have planning. So applying the test mindset of planning, we can identify when are things going to be ready to be tested. Who do I need to speak to about these changes? What needs to happen? How can we get test data in the environment? By thinking about all these things, and as a tester, these are things that we should be talking about and thinking about. We can kind of help tackle that. 
in terms of critical distance. By being unaware of the other team's service, you, you, you automatically have that critical distance. You're not embedded in that team. You can challenge them and kind of say, what about this? What about that? And then there's also experience. So we know what test data is needed for a live life experience. And that can kind of channel in to that. So in terms of challenge two, so for testing, contracts are changing all the time as teams implement new features. Becoming aware of these changes is difficult, let alone testing them. But then there's also the challenge about what should be stubbed. I'm testing things in my test environment. What needs to be stubbed and how do we stub it? Because obviously the idea of stubs is great, but when the stub becomes so complex and it's almost like its own living service, that's a challenge in itself. Um, so we need to work, think about collaboration. We need to work with the teams, understand what the contract changes are, understand when they're going to be ready to be tested, and then you can take it from there. Critical thinking. So team B may say that their tests do this, but we need to make sure that their tests do do that. We need to make, understand what their tests are doing so that we don't duplicate the tests. And then creative exploration. I mean, we've all heard of contract tests. Can we implement something like that to kind of tackle this? So bigger picture, teams work independently can sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. This happens a lot. Um, you become so entrenched in delivering your features, delivering your service, that you lose sight of actually what it is your service is meant to be doing and all the other services that work together. Um, so in terms of experience, we know what the customer impact is. What other teams does this change affect? We can start asking these questions. We can work closer together with other teams. There are ways we can communicate. So there are many ways. We have Facebook at work. We have Slack. We have Skype for business. We have Skype. We have emails. We have face-to-face. -face. Choose a form of communication. Find out what works for you and go with that. And then it's critical distance. What's the bigger impact of these changes? Have people thought about that? Ask these questions. It's important. Um, and finally, technology. So in terms of different teams and different tech, moving people from team to team is challenging. But then there's also the support aspect. Once your service goes into production, someone's got to support it. It may be your team, but it may also be another support team. How do you, how do you relay the knowledge that you have about that service to the support team? So again, make collaboration, work with the support teams, make them aware of your services, make them aware of the logs, make them aware of the monitoring that you have in place so that when things go wrong, and things will go wrong, they know how to support it. Creative exploration, you know, learn the new tech. Don't be scared if someone says about this new technology and you're gonna be joining that team, learn it. That's what we're here for. And critical thinking, do we need to use this technology? What problem is this tech trying to solve? Right, you mentioned about spec flow. It's a great example. What problem is that solving? Right? Spec flow is not BDD. People confuse it all the time. Just ask these questions and kind of make sure that the team understand the tech and make sure it's actually solving a problem. So this is a testing mindset to me. There's probably other aspects, but as a tester or a QA engineer, whatever it is we're calling ourselves these days, we are a valuable piece of a software team. We care about the quality culture, but we also have to test, right? We have to do all of these things. We also have to test the software. Um, so there are many challenges in any form of software development. I'm not going to lie. Otherwise, anyone could do it. Whether we're working with microservices or whatever, we need to continuously look for ways in which our unique position as testers and the mindset and skills that we have can help us and our team overcome them. And that's it. So thank you. Are there any questions? Sorry. Uh, no, <laughs> maybe other people do, um, so feel free to jump in if you have. Um, contract testing is definitely something that we, we try to implement, but there are just so many teams, right? It's, 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 it's an uphill battle from the start. Um, it's a matter of kind of coordinating, again, like collaboration is a great thing, right? So work with other teams and kind of helping them, but there are just so many teams, it, it is very difficult. We haven't even used contract testing. So the, the teams test their own microservices um, and then they stub out the, the subsequent contracts. And that's it. But we are looking at contract testing, but it's just where do we start? Um, do you also do anything like versioning with the contract as well? Yeah, we do have versions as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool.
yeah i understand this uh, microservices they are like individual simple functions they are they do one thing but then uh, in real life scenario there are there must be there will there has to be one orchestration service which which has to connect to all the microservices and um, at the end of it it has to kind of do some uh, analysis and processing so how how was your experience in testing such scenarios so like end to end yeah um so that is a big challenge like i say like checking the right versions deployed and things like that so we have uh, a happy path happy journey test which tests the end to end journeys so they, there's like 15 core journeys that we test and if everything ties together then then we're good um, but that isn't just all that we do there is some exploratory testing as well that we do to, to kind of help that each microservice has got its own uh, data store or yeah, each microservice will have its own data store which yeah, its yeah. own data store yeah okay yeah, I have a question. Uh, so previously we had the SOA and web services, and uh, so is this microservices a bit similar, or what is the main difference between that and uh, microservices? Between web services and microservices. Web services, SOA. The well, I guess it depends on what the web service was doing, but microservices generally, like like I say, do do one thing and just do it well. They're not concerned with doing multiple things. Arguably, like the web service could do the same thing. It's just another word for it. Did you have a question? Huh. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Did Priya send you the link? Did Priya send you the Zoom link?
Hi guys, a bit loud. We are starting the third and final presentation. So we're now going to hear from Katrina, who's going to discuss how to do save time by teaching first to test our own code. Thank you. So my name is Katrina, and I'm so excited to be here today. This is my first talk ever, okay. and. Um, yeah, let's start. Today I would like to share with you our success story, how we managed to save time by teaching developers how to test their own features. So I work at Badoo. Badoo is a dating company and um, we actually have 388 million registered users and every day 300,000 people sign in and register and our 60 million monthly active users generate 350 million messages per day and we are live on android ios blackberry windows phone mobile web and desktop web i personally test our ios application we are you can find us in app store it's really great and in iOS, we have weekly releases that has up to eight features, up to 24 bug fixes, and up to nine technical tasks. And all of that weekly needs to be tested. 
So what problem did we have? We wanted to do some interesting tasks, automation, non-functional testing, and so on. But due to high reopen rate, we found ourselves being loaded with regressions and just didn't have time for those valuable things that we also thought were important. So we decided to work on our reopen rate. Imagine the perfect world with ponies and butterflies. In this perfect world, it would only take development time plus testing time to get a feature to master. In our case, it is multiplied by two because we test feature both in branch and in integration. However, in reality, sometimes reopen happens. And at this stage, we start adding time. First thing, we add time for ticket being reopened and waiting for it to be picked up by developer. Then we add time for contact switching and bug fixing. After that, we add time for waiting in review queue, in QA queue, and finally retesting. And with only one reopen, we add time for five additional items, which is not cool. So our team came up with this brilliant idea of QA equals no ticket. This basically means that ticket is merged to master without being tested by QA on any stage. Of course, it's easy to say let's move tickets without QA, but we knew that we needed to provide developers with a guideline how to perform sufficient testing for their own features. And this is how we created a testing mind map. So the tool that could help them to know what testing is sufficient for their feature. So the mind map consists of 10 sections. As you can see, it's functionality, user interface, navigation, billing, statistics, network, automation, consistency, other, and communication. The biggest one is, of course, functionality. We here need to make sure that feature works as it is designed to. So all the checks look like this, but the most important ones is to check positive cases, main iOS versions, all positive, all possible input options, um, usability of buttons and controls, as well as permissions. Uh, the stars stand here for the important checks. So the next sec section is user interface. It's very important because this is what our user interacts with. And here the main checks are uh, performing visual QA. This is when developer takes their feature to designer and uh, designer verifies that all the screens look fine. Then uh, pagination, press states, multi-lines, and other checks in this section. The next thing is navigation. We want to make sure that user gets the perfectly working app when they open it from different entry points. So here, the most uh, important ones are checking folding, unfolding, locking, unlocking, healing and relaunching, um, different cases with opening up from pushes, landings, 3D touch, navigation to another up and back, as well as model open screens. The next thing is billing. So here we suggested developers to verify all our payment options. So sandbox, credit card, PayPal. We need to make sure that first purchase works as well as one click payment if user purchases it for the second and next times. And never forget for countries with no payments because sometimes we get really nasty bugs there. The next thing is statistics. We need to make sure that our feature is tracked correctly. And here we need to check all the stats we can send. It's server and console logs, hot panel, Jimba, and AppSpire. The next thing is network. Because we test mobile application, it's very important to check different connectivity cases. And here, 
it's really nice to use network link conditioner to uh, check different networks like 3G, Edge, Wi-Fi, as well as no connection. And in case of 3G, Edge, we need to make sure that loaders and placeholders appear there. The next thing is automation. As a QA guys, we all know that automation is a very powerful tool. Here, we wanted developers to get involved and to run automation tests so they are useful for developers as well. And here, we suggest them to run regression suite full or only those parts that were attached by the feature, obviously, and tell automation team if something breaks by their changes so that automation team could apply a quick fix and everyone is happy. The next thing is consistency. Sometimes um, we get the situation when developer implements feature after it is already implemented on other platforms, Android or mobile web, and then we need to make sure that on that our implementation basically matches the implementation on other platforms. The next thing is other, which here stands for security. So we needed to check signing in, signing out, signing in with a different user, captures, security pages, and so on. And finally, communication. Of course, um, we told developers that we are here, we are ready to help, and if you need any help with test scenarios for your QNO ticket or any help at all, we are here. You can ask some questions as well as you can ask questions from product team and like team that writes technical documentation for us. So when we saw all sections, it's no time to see the full picture. It looks like this. And obviously the reaction of developers at first was a bit like this. So the first question was, do we really need to test all that, which uh, was followed by the next one? And how much time would it take? So here we needed to clarify that mind map is only big because we don't know with what part of application you are going to work. So we try to predict all the cases, but most likely you won't need to use the complete mind map and it won't take as much time as you think it will. So yeah, you only need to use those checks that are applicable to your particular ticket. So what we thought, we thought that better testing on development stage will lead to better understanding of feature and dependencies, which will then lead to a better quality in branch QA and we get faster delivery. So everyone is happy. However, when we took this path in reality, uh, firstly, we had quite a few bugs with QA no tickets, which was expected probably. But then we kept working with the termination. We tried to find dependencies, tried to figure out why this happened, how we could prevent it. And in a month or so, we saw the first results. So time savings were really noticeable. And to sum up, before we started, almost all the tickets were tested by QA. Now we have 54% of bugs and 23% of features done as QA no tickets. Which means that our involvement in test automation grows. So at first, when we got a bit of time and started investing it into automation, we could only do some simple tasks. However, now when we have already experience, we know our base and so on, we can accomplish some really interesting tasks by ourselves, like implementing features and so on, which is really key. So thank you for your attention. This is the link to how I created this mind map and how you can create your own. And 
Thank you very much for my team who is here to support me. <laughs> That's it. Do you have any questions? Um, basically, um, we have dedicated automation team, and at first, um, when developer saw that something was broken in his branch, he went to those guys. However, now we have the experience and the ability to fix the tests by ourselves. Does it answer your question? <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, can you hear me? Um, in my experience, uh, developers tend to have an as implicit assumption and mindset that their code works. And testers have an implicit assumption that code doesn't work. That is true. So how do you get the developers to think like testers without destroying their appetite for developing? That is a really good question, thank you. So basically, the question relates to the mindset, right? And uh, when we gave this responsibility uh, to, like, when developers got this chance to merge tickets without QA, they also got this responsibility. So if anything happens, it's, it's their kind of responsibility to quickly detect and fix and so on. So I think this change of mindset comes with this responsibility. So, <laughs> you see, 46% uh, of bugs and 77% of features are still tested by QA. We now have more time for automation, for non-functional testing, but we still do our job. We still test features, but we now test a bit less. We save time by teaching developers how to do it. Because uh, QA uses their analytical kind of thinking to come up with various scenarios to test a particular feature, which developer generally tend to ignore. How do you come up uh, over this problem? So it's uh, the responsibility of developer to ask if they need, for example, test scenario. So if the feature is even complicated, there is a chance that developers will do it as a QA yes. But if they still want to do it on their own, they can ask for test scenarios, which we will provide, and they will execute. And that's it. Another one here. Oh. Um, what uh, the, the development um, tasks in terms of testing, do they stretch across all of QA, or is it just unit? And integration or is it system and performance and everything else um, they basically they implement unit tests we almost don't have integration tests so they execute the, those tests from mind map manually so in case if their feature touches performance if it touches navigation and so on they will have to do it, so they will have to run the tests that we have uh, in this area, and they will have to do the sufficient uh, testing themselves. So, every area. Yeah. Um, why weren't they doing sufficient unit testing in the first place? Mm, can I actually pass the mic? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't think there are any rules. So, well, the best excuse would be historical reasons. <laughs> you know, yeah, it always yeah. works. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But yes, let's say if we talk uh, to the period before 2014, probably, 
uh, they were quite high turnover in the team. Mobile was very young, so cold was questionable. So, on. so basically, we started all these improvements. Starting from 2014, we started uh, investing time in unit tests, automation, and so on. So we currently have uh, I, uh, our glass figure. So we have around uh, 5,000 tests. Uh, 4,000 of them are unit tests. We have uh, visual regression testing uh, done on screenshot based also supported and written by developers but only like five or ten uh, cases which you can call service level uh, and uh, the top of this cone is uh, end-to-end -end scenarios we have uh, 1400 of, of them so the, we are trying to shift this paradigm back to a uh, normal pyramid that's uh, what our developers now invest in time on like uh, bringing uh, some part of 1400 uh, end to end tests to service level. And we do have uh, now this performance and so on embedded into end to end. So they have, uh, we have different um, uh, graphs and different logs and so on. So we can enable profiler and run our tests using uh, under profiler and uh, all this data would be dumped into logs and so on, which we can later analyze. But that's the stuff that we're working on. I'm very bad. It's Robert, sorry. Um, why are the testers not, in, uh, sorry, developers not involved in writing the automation framework rather doing manual testing? Because manual testing, even testers don't want to do. Why are you asking <laughs> poor developers to do it? Well, that's a good question as well. I think <laughs> the historical reasons would be that. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, yeah. I'm not going to throw it, I'll just pass it around. Say it, I'm so uh, right, right now, we are starting investing some time into integrational testing, but still, especially because of architecture and million of depend dependencies it's impossible to test full cases. We can test like as unit test some separate an instance maybe. But if you want to test some flow, for example, we implemented, let's say some components and we want to present and make sure that everything is visible. Then when we would press on it, a request would be sent. We need to respect all dependencies on styles that include fonts, color, and so on, on dependencies on network, all dependencies related to navigation, and so on. And right now, as historical reason, it's very hard to respect them. But we are in the process. Any other questions? What? Sorry. You had one? Um, yeah, two very quick questions. What um, What's the dev to QA ratio on your teams? and? Also, ask, are you asking your developers to um, record how much of the mind map um, they've covered off in a particular non-QA ticket? Uh, so we don't request developers to mark uh, how much of the mind map was like uh, went through, but I mean, this is their responsibility, so they are very much interested in it. Uh, the second question, what is the ratio? It's quite uh, untraditional, I would say. I think we have uh, mm, 1.3 developers per one QA. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very human. The rest of the is like 1.5. But there are cases not QA at all when uh, 1.5 is. I use yes. Part of historical reasons and part it was also mistaken in the US is by significant mind fire that has been in the US. Yes, we have been jumping to the US. Yeah. But this also not only helps us to save time, it also tries to fix uh, QA to their frustration. We, we scale our development team, but we stop scaling our QA team and we try to fix that because we cannot scale QA <laughs> uh, indefinitely. Yep. Any more questions? Do we have time? Yeah, thank you. I have one very quick topic. I was wondering why you were trying to connect different languages to your application. 
Wow. I guess historical reasons. <laughs> <laughs> The, t- the ticket that, that you were getting returned, was that in production or was that as a result of system testing? Sorry, the, the, the reason why you went through all this mind map in the first place was the ticket that you got back from production or was it? Uh, no, it was the general flow that we wanted to change because we, we just wanted to do more and we just didn't have time. Okay, so was, it's a reopened ticket, that was the phrase you used, wasn't it? I was just wondering if that was a production ticket or... No, 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 it's just general like reopen rate on which we were trying to work. So, like, most of the tickets were reopened. Okay. So, most of the tickets on production were previously reopened, so they were not sufficiently tested by developers when they moved it to QA stage. So I guess that's it. Okay. So I guess that's the end of the of this meetup, right? Uh, on behalf of Just Eat, Priya and I would like to thank you and the Q and E roundabout for uh, helping us uh, organize this event. So hopefully we'll see you again. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Zoe's colleague. I just wanted to tell everyone about the next meetup, which was hopefully going to be at a company called Quantum Black. It will be, yeah, it will be next month, but we're, we're going to confirm the date for the meeting tomorrow. But it should be which date? 24th okay cool um, and the we do have we do run a couple of other meetup groups just in case you're all interested um, the next the next one is the JVM roundabout which will be on the 31st of this month at Ticketmaster so uh, if anyone's interested in Java and that's also going to be about microservices in fact um, so that's on the 31st. Um, we also do the Agile Roundabout and the JS Roundabout. And the JS Roundabout is going to be on Thursday, the, I think, 40, 14th. And that's going to be at Compare the Market. And then we have another one, the Agile Roundabout, which is going to be at, I forget, but uh, it's the, th- the last Thursday of next month. So just to check out meetup.com but thank you and thanks to just eat for hosting and uh, getting all the beers and the pizzas that's very kind of you that's it